all of that stuff is so good. And, and I like, I think it's true to sort of Wendy's nature to be like, I, I, I don't give a shit about smart marketing moves. Like, this is how you tell this story. And, well, Butch and Steve, I don't think that you would have liked it any other way. You know, I felt like I was making this film, they were who I was making the film for. It was, it's their legacy, and that sounds a little bit unhumble, but I think it is, it needs to represent something that happened, you know, in, um, in our lifetimes, and it's, it's important. And so if they didn't feel like it represented that, then it would be different. Anybody else? You, sir. There's a lot of great stuff in the documentary about the, uh, the psychogeography of Madison. It's, you know, it's not Chicago or uh, Akron or Dayton or Detroit. It's like the Midwest of the Midwest. And as someone who comes from the same place as Shirley, I was kind of interested in what she thought about coming to this place and what its location meant to her instead of, it wasn't LA, it wasn't New York. Did that have a, a different meaning to you because of where it was or where it wasn't? Well, I think Craig is, is from my city. We know each other. He's an incredible music journalist from Edinburgh, Scotland, and uh, has had a phenomenal career for years and years, and we have known each other for as long. And I, we just, at the end of this documentary, we were like, isn't this crazy? Because these are the bands we were listening to shortly before I left Edinburgh to come and meet the band. What is extraordinary, I think, that, hi that is so great about the movie is it is sort of, like you're saying, is it crosses into general worldwide musical uh, like uh, affiliation in that we felt the same growing up in Scotland. Nobody cared about the local right. Scottish scene. Right. And everybody went through London. Nobody cared what was happening north of the border. And so watching the film and hearing what those guys were saying about the Midwest scene, I was like, oh my God, that's what it's like growing up in Scotland, you know? And I think the same can be said for any small, like, you know, country or yeah. uh, any town that's not the capital yeah. of massive continents, yeah. you know? So I really did respond to that in the movie a lot. I was like, oh, oh yeah. Maybe and, this and, is the and the bar on every maybe. corner. And the bar on every corner. There's also the LA sort of connection where like you you came out of a very different scene and I don't know how the film resonates with you being sort of an LA you know band is there do you feel like it's different or well we got there in the winter so it was like <laughs> the shining with beer <laughs> Daylight, it's really weird. But uh, so that's all I can. Do. But I'm from Chicago, so it's like I get it. But this is, you know. But what Shirley was saying earlier about people who do shit that's not for money, and it's just like because they love it and they want to do something cool, and it becomes a cultural hub, and then it gets some recognition and it becomes fucking worldwide. That is some goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps right now just thinking of that. It's um. It's pretty phenomenal, and it's and it's an ode to everybody who does something proactive in their own little community. Yeah. And not everybody, of course, goes worldwide, but anything can fucking happen. I mean, yeah. magic happens, right? And it doesn't. It, I'm sorry, I'm like I'm off on one now because I, I it makes me think about people talking about the significance of us all as just individuals. You know, yeah. well, you know, Kanye West is so significant because he's so famous. You know. Meanwhile, like all these little bands yeah. that we all grew up obsessed by, you know, yeah. whether they were local Scottish bands or they were local yeah. Cal uh, Chicago bands yeah. from bloody Baroque or what have you, <laughs> they, <laughs> they changed our, our, our lives yeah. and they changed how we viewed music and the way we viewed ourselves. And I think it's really, it's, well, that I, to me, that's what's kind of beautiful about the documentary is it reinforces that idea of largeness is not necessarily better. Yeah. Famous is not necessarily better than ordinary. You know, yeah. Yeah. I think we're all at a point in this culture where we're so sick of having all that homogenized nonsense thrown down our throat and unique, small, beautiful brushstrokes are, yeah. as, are as important as these large, bold, yeah. spewings. Yeah. <laughs> yes, be, being an artist is not about monetary gain, it's not about being on the cover of some magazine. It's putting the time in yeah. 
and the passion and the art, and you have to be totally 100% into it. If you are, you are an artist, whether someone discovers your work or not, whether you make it onto the, onto the internet or YouTube and get 10 million hits, it does not matter. You are an artist if you put the time and work into it. And that's, I think, something that all of us, yeah. all of us here have, have <coughs> discovered in, in our lives. It's like, it's, you have to be 100% completely passionate about it. I have a, I have a very quick um, time and effort butch story, if I can share this with you real quick. Uh, there's a park in Silver Lake that's, that's right by the, the lake there. And I was there with my kids one day, and uh, Butch was there with his daughter. And I don't forget how old she was at the time, maybe seven or eight. Butch had a kite, and was gonna go fly kites with his, his daughter. And I saw him, and we were kind of talking. And, and the kite was being uh, uncooperative um, on this particular day. And like the string was all fucking like wrapped around the kite. And, and he really wanted to get this kite off the ground and in the air and his daughter was there and I was went off with my kids and I turned around like maybe an hour later <laughs> and he's down on his like hands and knees trying to weave the kite out of its just death grip of craziness that was going on. His daughter had long since like, <laughs> like he bailed and, she yeah. bailed and another maybe half hour goes by I look over and Butch is still getting into it. And God damn it, if he didn't get that kite yes. up in the air, I, 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 so I was like, I think that's a particular kind of individual that can do that sort of thing. Um, Danita can talk about the strobe tuner and relate to that story very well. <laughs> Butch had a strobe tuner that was like a psychedelic, um, what's it called, op art, optical art thing yeah. that, I mean, it, we would... We spent a lot of time tuning <laughs> yeah, our guitars. It was like, and your eyes would start to cross, and you'd be hypnotized by the strobe tuner. It was hard, you know. Hard, I, I got very experience. obsessed about the tuning because you who bang on tune? the guitar, bang hard, and when you bang hard on the guitar, it goes out of tune instantly. <laughs> and the whole time I was like, okay, you got to beat the shit out of the guitar, but let's try and keep it in tune. Yeah. So you're, we probably spent. If you add all the time up yes. on the on the budget for the record, yeah. two entire days were probably yeah, just spent tuning, tuning the fucking guitar to the stroke. Yeah. yeah, it was intense. <laughs> but the guitar is in tune. But it was the, in album, tune. the album is in tune. No, and you set the bar for every producer after us. They'd be like, that's, that's not as in tune as... As good are, hey, yeah, that's right. So I guess, though, the... the, the, the the, the weird thing to take away from everything I guess that we're saying tonight is you, I don't even think it's about being an artist it's just about being a human being and having that kind of <laughs> care to do your job well it doesn't you don't have to be a fucking artist you know we're all a bunch of freaks but you can apply that kind of ethos to anything that you do in your life you know yeah. that's at least how I think. Yeah. all right um, yes you ma'am <laughs> wow. I mean, that's a fan. I think I was I think I was sitting behind you during the screening and there was a lot of dancing and hooting and hollering. So you're you're like, Madison. Alright. This is like my childhood flashing before my eyes. So thank you. Everyone's like, why are you so into garbage? I go, I just used to see Butch play drums when I was this big. Like you just like have you know like a big deal. So thank you so much. And quick question, Dave Benton once told me. Scooter almost got signed to Atlantic and Electra, is that correct? And they wanted you to sound like Porter, and then they wanted you to sound like Porter Flash, and it like never happened. But, <laughs> that, like, yeah, really, yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we, had a couple uh, of very close signings. Um, Electra was one, also Capital. We, we put out a, as you know, we put out an EP, and I think it's touched on in the film, and when you put that out in your local market, back then, all of a sudden you're a big deal. Wow, they put out some original music, and, and we instantly got a pretty big following in the Madison scene. And uh, the best story of that is uh, we got a uh, phone call from Arista Records, and uh, Clive Davis wanted to see us play. And we had, didn't have any gigs scheduled, and uh, we quickly scheduled one for the next weekend in Chicago, and we'd call up one of the clubs and went, and went down there and played a show that no one knew about. And it was one of those super weird 
moments that you just you remember in the back of your head. Uh, when we got to the sunshine, we call all our friends, but only you know, maybe 20 people came to the gig. But before the gig, the guy in the club said, I just want to warn you, man, uh, we've had this, we have a, a citation out for this guy across the street who's got a CB radio. It broadcasts on the same frequency as our PA. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, motherfucker, what's going on? Oh, I'm coming downtown and I woo you! Louder than the band. Like, as long as the band was on, the CB radio came on full blast. And so we told our tour manager, our buddy Pete Love, Pete, you gotta go distract this guy. Just go over there, get it done. He had guard dogs like uh, uh, pit bulls out in this uh, this fence around. It was right across the street from the venue. I said, Pete, just get him down and talk to him during our set, so he will not go up and broadcast on the CV. Meanwhile, our manager, who was the guy who ran a record store, Bob Bartel, went and picked up Clive Davis at O'Hare, and Bob was so nervous he took he forgot to take the parking brake off. And on the interstate, on the way to get his car started on fire, the, 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 the parking brake started on fire, he had to pull off on the side of the road. Was, he's standing there with Clyde Davis on Interstate 94, oh and had to wait, call, they had to wait until the police guy got a cab to pick him up, so he's losing it. <laughs> and we were so fucking nervous. Clyde Davis, it, it, there was, this is a packed room. There were about six people in the audience, and, and Clive Davis is sitting right there. And we played about maybe eight songs or so. And when we finished playing, he goes, well, come on, let's talk. And we, we went down and said, he goes, I'd like to offer you guys a, uh, I think 